sinners crucified Oh holy sacrifice Behold the Lamb of God Behold the Lamb Behold Oh, 
everybody, put your hands together. See, we're going to sing it anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You are so good. So good to us. People should be happy. You should be free. Thank you, Jesus. We are going to fly away for real. <laughs> you can stop that. You can stop it. I, I tried it. In my car, it works. For some reason, every time I do it here, it does that. So I'm going to sing the last verse, and y'all are going to sing it with me, and we're not going to do music. Just a few more weary days, and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Hallelujah, but I'm coming back one day. How about you know that? The reign and rule with Christ on this earth for a thousand years. Rick, Missy, welcome back. Amen. They've been on their week vacation. And uh, I believe, Michelle, it's yours. God bless you. And I want to see me in the message, good or bad. Hallelujah. All righty then. Um, Rick, whenever you can, it doesn't matter which presentation, just one of the ones that will open, if you could go ahead and open it up. And we have, um, basically I have no notes up here today. We have everything up on the screen. And today we're going to be talking about our true colors. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, true colors? You know, we meet people every day and we might not know them right away, but after a period of time, we get to know them and we find out their true colors. And we see this, I mean, in scripture as well. And there are several scriptures we're going to pull out. Yes, sir. Is that on the stick you gave? It is. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, there, it talks about true colors in scripture. And that is what we're going to talk about today. So, before we get too far here, I do have a couple of sheets I'm going to pull out while they're trying to get that pulled up there. And I'm going to read this from the Message Bible, and we will go back to this scripture later, but this is in James 1, verse 3 through 5. And you didn't even know that that phrase was uh, scriptural, did you? James 1, 3 through 5, it says this, and this is in the Message Bible. You know that under pressure, your faith is forced, your faith, I can't see the other words on my sheet here. Faith walk, I believe, or something like that, is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so that you will become mature and well-developed. Wow. You guys, it will take a couple of minutes to pull up. There's a lot of pictures in it, so don't fret if it's not pulling up right away. Under pressure, your faith is tested and forced into the open and shows its true colors. Boy, I'm getting a lot of head shakes going on in here. Somebody just heard something. <laughs> Amen. Amen. How many of you in here are going through a trial of some sort in your life? Am I talking to the right crowd today? All righty then. All righty then. Don't try to get out of anything prematurely prematurely. 
Now, as they're pulling that up, I was going to wait until later to do this demonstration, but I think I'll go ahead and do it now for the sake of time. How many of you know what this is? Can you see it? It's like this is called a prism. Okay? Prism. <laughs> Now, I'm not sure if I can do this here or not with all the other lighting that's going on, but I do have a picture of it just in case it wouldn't work. One moment, please. Michelle, yes, ma'am. Please get the uh, book, the chapter. James 1, 3 through 5. Okay. Oops. Let's see. And it's in the Message Bible, so yours may not read exactly the same. Let's see. Can you guys see up here on the wall, as I'm shining this bright light through this prism, there's a little bit of a reflection, but it's hard to see with all these other lights in here. Yeah, I know, but it's kind of still may be hard. there. All righty then, if I knew more about these. Okay. It's still that one shining from over there, but that's all right. Thank you. Not sure if I can do that or not. Well, maybe not. It was easier to do at home when, all the, when it was absolutely pitch black. But as you shine a light into a prism, what you see is basically a rainbow. A rainbow comes out. And the reason that you see a rainbow is because light has color. And the prism is deflecting it the, into a, the rays. It's separating the rays out so you can actually see the color. Michelle, I don't have it. Can we pause just for a second, please? Sorry about that, Gutty. All right. How do you like that? And we can go ahead and leave each screen up. We can just, we're going to go through the whole thing as we're here today. Let's go ahead into the next frame. So we're talking about your true colors. Do you know what your true colors are? They can't see it on this one, but they can see it on one. Okay, he's got it. Turn around, you can see the bright colors on the screen. <laughs> Woohoo! Hmm? Ad lib day, may as well. It's all good. We're all family. All right. This is the test to see your true color. <laughs> Can you go with the flow or do you get all tense? Ah, oh, it's not working the way I want it to. It's just a thing. It's okay. I feel like Vanna. Okay. The theory behind true colors can be traced back to when Hippocrates, back in 460 BC, identified four different temperaments of humans. No, I'm not going to sit here and preach on those four things. I'm just touching on it so you can see where it started. Sanguine means optimistic and social. The cleric group was short-tempered or irritable. Nobody's like that, though. Phlegmatic, relaxed and peaceful. And the melancholic, analytical and quiet. And it also began in Plato's, in 428 B.C., his ideas about character and personality. And you can keep going as I finish each one, if you don't mind. We have all these different sayings. Everyone's true colors show eventually. Next. Pay attention when someone gets mad. That's when their true colors show. How do they handle anger? And we like to encourage people who are all excited they met someone and like one week later they want to get married. And they've never seen this person under pressure. They don't know how they're responding, how faithful they are. They know nothing about them. Don't get married. Just wait and see what they're like under pressure. Next one. Your true colors are beautiful like a rainbow. Don't let your character change color with your environment. 
Find out who you are and let it stay its true color. And a lot of times, a lot of people, they don't even know who they are. They don't even know what their true colors are. We're going to talk about that today. Go ahead. Don't be afraid to show off your true colors, good or bad. If we're in the family of the house of God, all right, how many of you have known me for five years at least? How many of you know me for 10 years at least? How many of you know me for 15, 20? I've been here 21 years. How many of you have known me for 30? <laughs> you weren't born yet. Willie's known me for about 30. No matter whether I have good colors or bad, y'all have loved me. Thank you. Next, light. We're talking about light. What does scripture have to say about light? Let's look at the next frame. What I was showing you with the prism, all the colors are in light. The prism, again, refracts or splits up the light, basically changing the direction of the rays of light. And light, again, takes many colors and spreads them out. The more light you have, the more vibrant, the more colors you're going to see. It takes many colors of the spectrum together to mimic the perfection of God. Next. Now, this is pretty awesome. You may not be able to see this very clearly. When I ran across this chart, and again, you're not in science class, but I love these little details. It's so awesome. And I have some of you scholarly folks that love these things as well. And the electromagnetic spectrum, and just to give you an example of electromagnetic, in nature, an example is lightning, the electric and the light together. This is the spectrum of what we know. You see where that one little line where it says, it's a little red line there and then it branches off into all the colors? That's our visible amount that we see. We can't see the rest of it. That's, that's all we can see in this spectrum. That's it. And it reminds me of that scripture in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now... We see through a glass or mirror, dim, dimly or darkly, but then face to face. Remember, God is light. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, even as I am known. The word darkly means abstractly or obscure, from a primary word meaning superimposition of time, place, or order. Right now, we only see this much of this much of what God has in the spectrum. When you look in the mirror, you're only seeing a dim reflection. The reflection was already there before you even saw it. When you walk up to a mirror and your brain processes, oh, that's me, you've already been there. You've already been on the image. That's how quick it is. And next frame, please. Look at the colors of the sunset. This was taken out near the, I call it the old Walmart, but it's actually the only one we have here now, I think, up there off of, uh, up near Otranto. Because when the sun is going down, it's shining differently on the clouds which contain water. So you have a different color of a sunset. Next. Here you go with a rainbow. The reason you can see the rainbow is because there is water and light together in the same area. Isn't that beautiful? I did not take that one. Next. This is another one of those science things that you cannot see from here. But this talks about the actual wavelengths or frequency of color. Each color has its own frequency, its own wavelength. The color red at the very bottom has a longer drawn out frequency than say the vibrant violet type color over at the top, which is more like this. So colors are important, is my point. Next frame. Chameleons. Isn't that cool? I love chameleons, but you know, I don't know if I'd want one in my house creeping around or anything, but yeah, I like them. Chameleons can rapidly change color by adjusting a layer of special cells that are nestled within their skin. Researchers have found that chameleons do not modify the hues or the colors of their skin by accumulating or dispersing pigments 
It's not pigments that changes their color. But instead, the lizards rely on structural changes that affect how the light is reflecting off their skin. It's about light. Light reveals true colors. Next frame. Be careful. Not all are what they seem. Some people pretend to be the beach, and they're actually quicksand. Steve Marshall. Next one. When I read that phrase, I thought to myself, okay, when we meet people or we see things, we think, oh, how beautiful person, what a wonderful person, they're doing all these great things, but do we really know who they are? You know, I, I see these frogs like this when I go to the aquarium, you know, these beautiful bright red frogs, and we all know, I mean, this is one, one of those poison blue dart frogs. You don't want to mess with him. But a child would see this and say, oh, how wonderful. Let's play. <laughs> My point is, a mature person who understands would not play with that frog. As we grow in maturity and we learn, we tend to stay away from things that we know are dangerous, even though they look beautiful. Next. Okay. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to tell on anybody, but I know somebody who's just like me when it comes to ice cream. Well, there's a couple of you guys in here who are members of the SICC club, the secret ice cream club, which isn't a secret now because I just told you. But, <laughs> yes, yes, Willie is on that. Yes, he is a member. Wanye is a member. Sheila's kind of on the outside looking in. She hadn't quite joined it yet. <laughs> Pastor Bob. <laughs> but this container says there's no artificial growth hormones used in the cows that produce the milk for this. Isn't that wonderful? It's organic. No, it's not the best thing in the world. I mean, small quantities maybe. Well, maybe larger quantities, but... It's true that sugar feeds all the cells in our body, but it also feeds cancer cells. Yeah. But research shows that eating sugar does not necessarily cause cancer, but it's what cancer does to your waistline that can cause cancer. What sugar does to your waistline that can cause cancer. Taking in too many sugar calories may result in weight gain. We didn't know that. And being overweight or obese puts you at a higher risk for cancer and other diseases. Yes, this was full at one time. Not anymore. Selah. All right, let's go to the next one. Oh, how many of you have ever seen this on the side of the road while you're driving? It's called kudzu. I think it's the most beautiful thing when you're looking at it. It's like, wow, it just totally transforms, you know, the side of the road, and it makes it look cool, especially when you're driving from here to Columbia, and it's like the most boring road, and you see these wonderful things. Kudzu was actually brought from the United States, to the United States from Japan in 1876. It was promoted as an ornamental plant for gardens and food for goats, cows, and pigs. It was also planted to control erosion in the south. So when they first brought it here, they're like, yes, this is awesome. Look how beautiful it's feeding our cattle. Let's go to the next screen. Kudzu kills or damages other plants by smothering them under a blanket of leaves, encircling those woody stems and tree trunks and breaking branches and uprooting entire trees and shrubs. Once established, kudzu grows at a rate of one foot per day. Mature vines can be 100 feet long. To successfully control kudzu, its extensive root system must be completely eradicated by cutting the vines just above the ground every month for two growing seasons, and all that cut material has to be disposed of, cannot be kept, destroyed. The United States Forest Service is searching for biological control agents for kudzu. It's out of control. It was wonderful when we first got it. Beautiful, but now it's shown its true colors, hasn't it? Ouch. So next time you're driving down the road, Floyd and I usually see kudzu and we look at each other and say, we hate kudzu. 
How about this beautiful kitchen? I love cabinets. I have maybe six or eight cabinets in mine. That is gorgeous. But have you ever opened someone's cabinets to really see what's inside? Do you really go in people's houses and open their cabinets, seriously? <laughs> no, but you never know what you'll find. Next. Yeah. I asked Rick not to leave that up there too long because I don't want anybody getting sick in here. Roaches. <laughs> Cockroaches everywhere. Cockroaches. You never know. But when you turn the light on, you find out real fast, don't you? Scurrying little creatures. Next. Now, we're talking about light and things being exposed. How many of you would be really, really happy if I knew your deepest, darkest secret? Which I do know some about some of you, but I would never tell. And I, what if I knew your deepest, darkest secret? And many of you know. And I walked up to you, and I put the light on you, and I stood over you, and I said, Ha ha, everybody, guess what? I know Josh's deepest, darkest secret. <laughs> and then I told you what it was. How would he feel? Absolutely betrayed. I would never do that. My sweet kid. But you know what? We think we have one up on people when we do that to them, when we're talking behind their back. That's sin. That is sin. God sees it as sin. Sin causes us to hide from God other Christians or anyone that would expose our sin. So when we have areas in our life that we're dealing with, is the first person you call, hey, Pastor Bob, how's it going today? Not. Is the first thing you do on Sunday morning, wake up and say, oh, I can't wait to get to church and worship the Lord. Not. Because sin separates us from God. But it not only separates us from God, it separates us from one another. Because we feel it, we carry it, and until we confess it and get it off of us, it's there. So we need to release it. So run to God. Run to God. How many of you have a specific place that you go to and you pray out loud and you don't care who hears you or not? It's just you and God. How many of you have a special place? How many of you have that place and it's your car? Big blue. Lawn mower, whatever it is. You get out there and you pray and you get, get everything clear with God. I want to encourage you. If you feel like there's something in your life that you know that you know is not right, get it right with God. Pray. You know what? He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from everything. You will feel 100% better. 100% better. There is nothing like having that. And it is much healthier for you. And we're going to talk about that a little bit too. Next. People may think they know your true colors because they know your past. Oh, well, that person's so and so because they did such and such. If they were focused on your past and not on who you are now, then nine chances out of ten, they are lacking the faith to believe that God truly is a healer and a deliverer. If people want to focus on your past and who you were, love them where they're at, but they're lacking the faith to believe how powerful our God really is. Because we are all in this room living proof of the power of God and what he has done in our lives. Where he has brought us from and where he is bringing us to. John 13, 35. I'm sorry, can you back up one second? By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you have love and unselfish concern for one another, I love you. And that's the way it should be. We should love one another right where we are. Amen? And cover each other. Not go blabbing about each other's mess. All right, next screen. 1 John 1.5. This is my favorite part. 
This then is the message which we have heard of him. Who's him? God. It is God. Just wanted to pause that longer pause to kind of let you all, you know, sit there and think about it. That we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Picture the brightest light you have ever seen. Maybe the one I just put over the top of Josh's head. There's no darkness in light. There's no black. Black is the absence of light. Okay, next screen. You see that picture? That's light. You see a shadow with that light? No. I've tested this. This is so true. There is no shadow. There's no shadow for light. Just think about that. There's no shadow. Next scripture. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights. Uh Uh-oh, what's lights? Well, I mean, I have the definition there. Luminous, to shine especially by rays, fire, be seen or shine. With whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He is the Father of the luminous. Who's the luminous? We are all light. Go ahead and the next one. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of Christ to the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and moral excellence and recognize and honor and glorify your Father who is in heaven. To glorify Him. When our true colors are shown, it's not, oh, it's so great. No, it's to glorify Him. It's, be, oh, you know, oh, you're so wonderful. You know, Spencer, I just really appreciate your woodworking. You're just one of the most incredible people in the whole wide world to me. I love you. And what does he do with that? To God be the glory. God. He can, he can use that moment if I'm an unsaved person to say, you know what? Jesus was a carpenter. He gifted me with this. And he can pull right into that ministry. He's a carpenter. It, that's a, for him, it may be hard to talk to people sometimes. Because, you know, I know Spencer. He's not one to really kind of, you know, get all out there. But, but he has an in with people talking about being a carpenter. But his colors and his giftings are shining to glorify God. Isn't that beautiful? Next one. But, and this is Ephesians 5.13, but all things become visible when they are exposed by the light of God's precepts. For it is light that makes everything visible. And let's stay right there for a second. All things become visible. What things? What about those things in me? Maybe those things I don't even know are there. Right, right. But he knows they're there. So all those things in me become visible when they are exposed by the light of God's precepts. What's the light of God's precepts? The light of his precepts is his word. The light of his precepts. Think about that. The light of the gospel. gospel. God himself. He is the light. Remember, God is light. It's his light that he shines on his precepts that makes those things in me become visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. All right, let's see the next one. Okay, wait, right there. Let's not, you're fine. Right, go back to the, um, the Ephesians 5 scripture, please. That's good. We, as a body of believers, have a responsibility to spend time with God. What do you think they did before this Bible was written? They didn't have a Bible to read. They, they spent a lot of time praying. 
They also spent a lot of time with their, their human spirit on the inside of them, connecting with God and asking him, Lord, is this the way I walk? Is this what I do? Lord, speak to me audibly. Tell me. I don't care. Let me know. And they tried to make their decisions, pace their decisions according to what they believe God wanted them to do. But we're without excuse, folks. They were busy writing. They were, yeah, they were busy writing for sure and printing more and more of these for us. And even though they tried to get rid of this book years ago, it's still here. We are without excuse. We have the very life of God right here. And as we read, we read and we're like, whoa, wait a minute, Lord. That's what I'm going through right now. Whoa, that's their weakness. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe that's my weakness. Maybe that's why I went through that. Lord, thank you for showing me so that I don't have to walk the same path that this person walked. Husbands, love your wives. This is Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives. Seek the highest good for her and surround her with a caring, unselfish love. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word of God. We're going to talk about that. So that in turn, he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy, set apart for God and blameless. Water is symbolic in Scripture as the Holy Spirit. So let's look at that again. By the washing of water. Okay, who's washing? The Holy Spirit. With what? How many of us have been running away from reading this? Now you know why. Because a lot of people are afraid to be told what to do or afraid to know that they're not perfect, that they might have an area that needs to be dealt with. And that's also very telling of a prideful spirit. It takes humility to submit to God and allow him to do the work in you because you know what? He uses trial and tribulation. He allows those things to happen in our life for a reason so that more light can shine through our lives. All right, let's go to the next scripture. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? No. no. Can you change yourself? No. If you could, you'd be the first person you change, now wouldn't you? If you could change anybody, it'd be you. But you can't do it on your own. It takes the Spirit of God to breathe life on those words, to breathe life to you, to show you that these are things we need to work on in our lives. Now, I want to encourage you. If you are a person that gets very defensive if someone brings something up, like, hey, you really shouldn't do that. Well, I just, you know, I, I'm going to do it because that's just what I do. And How many of you in here have ever done that? Come on. Let everyone else who still does it feel more comfortable. We've been there. Okay, we've been there. We've done that. We get defensive. Part of the reason we get like that is because there's an area in our life that still needs healing. Maybe it's a trust issue. You may not trust people because you've been wounded so many times. It may be that that particular person has hurt you and you've never gone to them and talked to them about it before. And so you're defending yourself because you still feel that funk when you're talking with them and you're like, well, who do you think you are? But you're not really saying that. You're just kind of, you know. We cannot change ourselves. You can be disciplined, and you can make changes, but there's a more eternal, inward work that God is wanting to get at. Next. Isn't that a beautiful leopard? Don't tell me what to do. How many of you in here get like that sometimes? Be honest. Don't you tell me what to do. I'm a grown woman. I know what to do. Well, here's some scriptures. I'm just going to read them to you. Proverbs 11, 14. You're funny, Deborah. Proverbs 11, 14. Where there is no guidance, a people fall, falls. But in abundance of counsel, there is safety. Proverbs 19, 27. 
Cease to hear my instruction, or instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Proverbs 18, 2. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man will listen to advice. Will listen to advice. Okay, next. James 1, 3 through 5, this is the scripture that I read earlier. You know that under pressure, your faith, life, is forced into the open and it shows your true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Next. How many of you remember the priestly garb that they wore to go into the temple? The high priest would go into the most holy place. And when he did, he had to wear, and you can go to the next screen, he had to wear this breastplate. And each one of those stones in that breastplate represented a tribe of Israel. Every single one of those stones that are in that breastplate, and I've done this study on this, it's pretty amazing. Every single one of those stones were created under pressure, testing, something. Every single one of those stones. Do we think we're going to get out of tribulations and tests? No. Can you imagine the awesomeness of walking into the presence, the very presence of God with that on your chest? And the light that shines through it just light up the whole area. How phenomenal. You know, how many of you remember the young girl who, has, uh, who was born, I guess she had a vision of heaven, and she painted the picture of Jesus, the way she believed he looked and everything, and what she saw in his bright eyes and all this. Well, one of the things that she said was that there were so many colors that no, no color palette could ever show her those colors again. Can you imagine the light? God is light. The light coming forth from him, his glory, his majesty, his righteousness is just, wow, shining through each of you because you have allowed the word of God to show you your true colors. And you've let him work in you so that that color can be seen more clearly? Wow. Okay, next. This is in Matthew 6, 19, and we'll, I think we go to 25. Do not store up for yourselves material or treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart, your wishes, your desires, that on which your life centers will be also. Next. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is clear, spiritually perceptive, then your whole body will be full of light, benefiting from God's precepts. I'm going to read that again. The eye. Now we're talking your natural eye, but also your spiritual eye. Okay? The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is clear, spiritually perceptive, your whole body will be full of light, benefiting from God's precepts. But if your eye is bad spiritually, or you're spiritually blind, your whole body will be full of darkness, devoid of God's precepts. So if the very light inside of you, or your inner self, your heart, your conscience, is darkness, how great and terrible is that darkness? What we put into our spirit will make a difference one way or another. Next. 
1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Proverbs 17, 3, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests hearts. This right here will test your heart. This right here will test you. How many of you feel like sometimes when Pastor Bob is up and he's preaching and he's saying something, you're like, man, I know he's talking to me. I just talked to him yesterday. I know he's saying that for me. And he, has, he had no idea. He wasn't even thinking about you from yesterday, but you thought he was talking to you. Because the Holy Spirit was using what Pastor Bob was saying to test your heart to see if you really heard what he said, to see if you understood what he said, to see if you were going to apply what was being spoken. And that's just one example. How many of you are familiar with the process of gold and the impurities that are in gold? Let's go to the next frame. The refining furnace. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Isaiah 48.10. God puts us through the fire to refine us. When you heat up gold, there's so many impurities in it that it comes to the top. Your true colors when you're in that little fire in place, huh? Your true colors come up to the top. And then they scrape it off, and nothing but pure gold is left behind. That heat, the fiery trials, right? Woohoo! The persecution Jesus went through. What did he tell us? Hey, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Get over it. And I hate to be so blunt because I wish, I mean, I'm telling you, there's a time in my life I was more concerned about what people thought of me that if they walked up to me and went, boo, I'd, ah. I was, I was the one in high school that did not sit around talking a lot. I did my schoolwork. I had a couple of friends and that was it. You wouldn't know that now. But we have to get to the point as a body of Christ that we are really spending centered time around God. Our lives are not our center. Our work, our marriage, our kids. That's not the center of your life. We think that everything that happens in my life in my home, that's my center, is my home, and everything else is an extension of my home. My job, my kids, my family, my church, my walk. But that's not the center of your life. The center of our life is our relationship with God. And out of that relationship with God, everything stems out. Our wife, our husband, our children, our job, our church, our ministry, everything else is centered or sprays out of that relationship with God. If we are focused on family and we're trying to get closer to God, there's always going to be something in the way. There's always going to be something in the way. But we're trying to, you know, we, we as, as people, I know as, as women, we have children, we have jobs, we have this, we have that, and cooking, cleaning, laundry, blah. But we have to, in order to survive, we have to take time to say, this is not my center. My family is not my center. My God is my center. And no matter what anyone says, because I'm going to be persecuted, I'm going to be talked about, I'm going to be spit on, laughed at the whole nine yards, people are going to bring up my past, they're going to bring up what they think my future is, they're going to say it all just like they did to Jesus. Who put Jesus on the cross? It wasn't the sinners who were repenting. It was the religious people. So don't be surprised if it comes from in, within the very house of God. They put Jesus on the cross, they're going to hang you up there too. Amen. Are you in the word and is the word in you? And that is important. We can read and study this word and we can know it inside and out, quote scriptures left and right, but is it in us? Is it in us? Is it life? 
Is it what causes us to live? I had my grandmother tell me recently, she feels like she's just waiting to die. She's sitting at home. I said, woman, <laughs> I did too, woman, I love you. You're one of the most gifted women I know. You can sing so beautifully. You know the word. You've got a phone sitting right next to you. Call people. God will put people on your heart. Call them. Talk to them. Speak the word of God into their lives. You are a light, every one of you, to this world. And God wants the light of himself to shine purely through us. And as we submit to God and say, okay, Holy Spirit, show me me. Show me. And I will not say, well, I, that's not me. I don't care how you bring it. Bring it to me from my child. Bring it to me from a leader in the church. Whatever, I'm not going to get my feelings hurt. Tell me what I need to do. Tell me if you see something that I need to fix. And I will go to God and say, Lord, I can't do it on my own. You are my God, and I submit whatever was said to you to work it out in my life. And then I move forward and walk and be faithful in what he said for me to do. Amen? Next one. Psalms 119, 105. Oh, I love this. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of God are being transformed. We're being transformed into the same image. What same image? Jesus. The same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Why is this so important that we read and ask the Lord to show us? Because if we want to be more like Him, We've got to look in the mirror. What do you see when you look in the mirror? What do you see? I had a comment, but that would have been really rude. (laughs) What do you see when you look in the mirror? Are you seeing Jesus? Do you see the reflection, that light reflecting back? The light, his light reflecting back? Because without a light, you can't see yourself in the mirror. You can't see yourself in the mirror. You got to have light to see yourself in the mirror. Do we open this book and say, okay, God, show me. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? <sighs> oh, yeah, I know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Do I sit there and introspect myself nonstop until I'm so beat up with everything I got wrong in me? No, no. This is not to be a cumbersome task. Just open the word and start reading and let him speak to you. Let him show you. Let him talk to you. It's not just about him pointing out what's wrong with you. It's about teaching you things and where to go and how to act and what's going to cause you to become a better person for you, your family, your, the body of believers. Next one. So what are your true colors? Do you know what your true colors are? Do you know how you will respond under pressure? What if something happened to your spouse today? How are you going to respond? Are you going to give up on God? Well, I don't understand, Lord. What am I supposed to do? What happens if one of your children pass away today? God, why did you make this happen? What are you going to do? Are you going to blame him? No. And many of you have dealt with death. 
But there's even greater things that could happen today, tomorrow. Have you been watching the news? At one point, the Lord showed me something that just took my breath away. I saw a vision of a young lady who had a young girl as her daughter. And there were people who were telling her, if you don't deny Christ, I'm going to rape your child in front of you and kill her. Could you stand up under that? How much do you believe? How much do you know your God? How much? How real is he to you? He is real, folks. How many of you have felt his presence? How many of you have sensed his love, his forgiveness, his salvation, his deliverance? You know that you know that you know that you know that there is a God and there is no turning back. No matter what the enemy throws at you, no matter what he tries to do to you or your family, God is God. And he will take care of you, whether it seems like he's taking care of you or not. Call it blind faith, I don't care, but it is faith, and he will honor it every time because he loves us. He loves us so much. Like that song we sang, how he loves us. He is jealous for me. And he loves like a hurricane. How many of you have been in a hurricane? <laughs> we live in Charleston. How many of you all been through a hurricane? His love is fierce. And he will go to the ends of the world for you. He already did. He sent his only son, only child, to die for you. His only, only child. If there's anyone in here who has never believed and never received Christ, but you know that you know that he's pulling on your heart today, today's the day. Just come up after the service and let's pray for you, that you can give your heart to the Lord. It's a whole new life that you will never regret. Amen? Amen. True colors. You know what I see? I see a body of people that have so much light and so many colors you guys just absolutely floor me every time I turn around. So many gifts and so many people serving and giving, like Pastor Bob was sharing earlier. We're like bees in a bee's nest, man. We're always doing something. Somebody's always doing something. Buzz, buzz. Bless you, all of you, for your hard work. Keep on keeping on and don't give up. Amen? Amen. Wow. Amen.